inquiries that teachers had in this garden we call research. Um, and it strikes me that we, uh, we in action researchers are, are kind of cast in the garden gnomes rather than the lush, lush uh, sweeping loans of, of research. And, and just following up from James, I would say we, we have to sort of, uh, you know, cherish the gnome, actually. Um, that uh, action research is actually where some of the real action is taking place or should take place. Um, and that's the quote that James referred to from John Hattie a couple of years ago. He was quoted in the, the TES, and as a good researcher, I'd like to cherry pick what he said, which is just that, that um, researching is um, it's a highly skilled thing to do, and only highly skilled people, therefore, should be doing it. Um, and, and that's all well and good, and I wouldn't want to uh, denigrate the, you know, the experts. I think it's really quite important to have people who are really good at that kind of thing. Um, but it does leave the rest of us in a rather quandary. Um, uh, what role do we have if um, we don't think maybe have the, the practiced skills of researchers um, if, we're only if we're only teachers? Um, um, there's, there's a, uh, Heather Mendick is an educational journalist, and she, she was um, uh, discussing this in the context of science. You know, if you see science, just like culture, if you like, as a, an established body of knowledge, only those people who have the skills and the, the, you know, the people at the upper echelons, if you like, are allowed to practice that thing. So she was saying professional scientists largely have the authority to make the decisions about science. And if anybody else has decisions to make science, it's perhaps another set of um, elites, if you like. And I, I've just taken her quote, and I pretended that I made this up, um, which is if you just replace the word scientist with the idea of an educational researcher, if it's only those people who are the most highly skilled, the most meddled, the most letters after the name, uh, working at the top universities, if they're the only people who are allowed to engage in um, educational research, where does that leave the rest of us? And actually, nobody gets to the kind of the, the, the micro bits of information that in fact they, that, that, that we need them to get to. So I, I propose sort of a notion of micro research, if you like. Um, and this is a report that came out just this year. Um, this came out of uh, Mike Caldwell, just the, alphabetically the first name on the list, I think. But it was from people from the Durham University, from Sheffield Howard University, and the Institute for Education in London. And they were saying that you know, teachers do want to engage in, uh, in research at some level, but they struggle to trust it. Um, they are unlikely to be convinced by it unless they see someone making it happen, usually in their setting. Um, they need to see the impact of it themselves before they begin to trust it. And that's a really powerful thing. Teachers want to be involved in this, but they don't want to risk changing what they do because they aren't convinced that it would make a difference to them and make, make, make the right kind of difference. And I strongly believe that action research or practitioner inquiry um, is the best way of making, of, of developing that trust in academic research that comes to us. Um, so if you like, I mean, that's just an image which is meant to be saying something like, we learn by doing. Um, and uh, you know, if I want my colleagues to engage with research, I've got to get them to experience doing it. The more they can do little bits of it, the more they can be engaged with it at a larger level. Um, so this is a model that we use at the London Centre for Leadership and Learning out of the Institute of Education. And these guys experienced um, uh, this cycle. Um, we kind of hid it from them most of the time. Um, but it, we did essentially go from around that circle. We, basically what we do is, and Vivian, I'm delighted that Vivian's here because she helped invent this kind of cycle, <laughs> which is that we start with um, you know, what difference we would, would we like to make. You can take a picture of your own slide. Um, what difference would you like to make for your class, for your students or for your teachers? Um, uh, then we'd say, um, uh, where are you now with that? You know, what is your baseline for this? Um, um, what's, what strategies can we develop of, of uh, developing, of uh, collecting data, which would be reliable, which would really tell us where we are right now? Um, then we would say, uh, what, what are the hunches? What, what sorts of ideas are there out there which seem promising? What are the highly probable things? Maybe it's, maybe it's peer feedback. Maybe we, we really, that might work for our boys in uh, our English classes. Uh, we, might, we might give that a go. And there's, there's some research which suggests it might be promising. Um, <coughs> then you try that out. 
And we try it out in as rigorous a way as is tenable for a working teacher. Maybe not as rigorous as the academic researcher for whom, you know, who's got a research grant to, to engage in that level of research or that level of rigor, but as rigorous as we can make it uh, while still doing our job and doing the best for our students as we, as we can. And once we've done that, and we develop some tentative results, maybe we won't be very secure about it, maybe we can have, I was just at the Christian session this morning, we talked about nuance, maybe we can only come up with nuanced findings, but once we've got those, how can we share them? So that, first of all, it would make a difference to my own teaching, then it might make a difference to the teaching of the people who uh, share an office space with me, maybe they're, they're teaching in the next room, the next classroom, and then maybe it might, I might be able to spark off an idea in other colleagues. In other words, can I be the trusted colleague that um, the teachers are telling researchers uh, that they want to see make this research happen? So that would be the kind of sequence we would go through. Um, and that was, if you like, the kind of, that's how we run our sessions. So I'm going to just go on and let, let the guys talk about what they did. That lets them, those are researchers in action. There we go. That's sometimes they eat fruit. Um, I'm thinking the pair of you share. Um, so, first up, I think, who's that? Richard. Uh, I think it is. Yes, yeah, that's me. Okay, yeah, um, I, I did a project um, based around trying to get two year 11 boys to improve their essay writing. In, it's all in the to exams. Um, there are some boys bumping on the bottom. I think um, even in a selective school like ours with the results are, are, are very good. There are still boys, I think, r really in a few months before you see, who are, who are, there's a few who may not pass. You know? um, and I think it, what, what we normally do is we, we do special sessions with them um, sort of after sort of January mock exams. And that's sort of kind of dovetailed with, with, this, with this project, basically. And I thought, well, the question that we, we, we were asked to ask ourselves is how do we know we're making a difference? And I thought, you know, how do I know my sessions are, are sort of useful? Um, and so I, I was thinking about reflection and expertise and the idea that, you know, people who are experts in any sort of field, that, that generally part of becoming an expert in anything is, is reflecting upon it, thinking about the performance, <coughs> what you did, what was good about it, how you can sort of get better, what you can do next time, all those sorts of things. And my, my sort of hunch, I suppose, was that boys who weren't doing very well didn't really do this. It's not part of their natural kind of thought process. So um, I'm also quite interested in, in self and, and peer assessment. I think uh, I think it's something we don't really do enough of in, in, in the school. And, 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 I, and I, 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 I sort of already spent some time in the classroom sort of asking boys about how they felt about these things and trying to get them to, to try them out and try to get them to, to get better at them. Um, so all these things sort of came together essentially in me doing a series of, 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 of sessions after school for sort of an hour, an hour and a half where um, they also do essay writing, generally model uh, writing a paragraph, um, then get the pupils to do a similar kind of task, writing their own paragraphs, then really uh, swapping work, sort of peer assessing, um, some, and then or sometimes self-assessing depending on what I did that week. Um, and then after that, asking them to then go back and improve their work, and then after that, reflect upon the whole process, reflect um, not only upon their own work, but also asking them to reflect upon the process that I just sort of put them through. So each, each session, um, I kind of collected their written thoughts on how they felt about looking at people's work, how they, what they got out of it, and, and, and what they got out of, uh, you know, people looking at their work, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was, it was really interesting, and I think what happened is in the end they, they did pretty well. I, I think that their essays got better. I mean, it, 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 it's a difficult thing to measure, and I, I actually don't think my my data collection is probably as, as good as it, as it could be. But it's a sort of learning process. I think each year I get better at doing it. Um, but I mean, what I found there's a few things that I found. Firstly, that the boys, because I, I sort of surveyed them, and they essentially spent almost no time reflecting on on their work when they produce a piece of writing, they didn't read it back through, they didn't proof it, didn't check it, and they very rarely seemed, when they got feedback, to actually think about it or apply it next time. It just wasn't really part of their framework, and they, they, they seemed to get a bit better at doing that during the course of these sort of six weeks. Um, they consistently liked sort of modelling approach, and, and, and I think what came out of that is, is 
we often have an assumption that after 11 years of English lessons, they, they know what a good paragraph looks like, they know what an essay looks like. But actually, they didn't really, um, which you know, quite surprising. And, and I think that what came out of that is, is also the idea that if you want to get better at writing essays, you don't necessarily write more essays. You actually practice the, the, the individual skills, and actually the, then the whole thing gets better, which, which was you know, quite interesting to me, I think. Um, I think ultimately, the other interesting idea, which is probably something to explore a bit further, is that they seem to get better at self-assessment through doing peer assessment. If you can, if you give them very clear success criteria for, for, for looking at, at someone else's work, they they start to practice those skills and then are able to apply them to their own. So, I I, I feel like doing peer assessment makes them better at self-assessment, therefore makes them better sort of learners. Um, let me answer the questions in the Okay, um, so I'm a head of year um, at the City of London, I'm head of year eight. Um, um, I became interested in the idea of mindset and Carol Dweck's ideas about, about growth mindset, and I was kind of intrigued as to what extent I thought that engaging with ideas of, of mindset might be the sort of silver bullet that allows. Uh, year eights to sort of unlock progress and you know, encourage them to be interested in their work and see the virtue of effort as it went on. And what I tried to do is try to kind of take this intuition that growth mindset is a good idea and it should be something I should be trying to inculcate within the year group and see to what extent that held up. Um, I also thought that as a school we gather quite a lot of data about uh, students in an attempt to track their progress. So uh, they get things like half term grade cards, which uh, are teacher-assessed views of attainment and effort. So the teacher will interpret, I think you're putting lots of effort in, I think you're not putting huge amounts of effort. Um, and what I wanted to do was try and use these data sources to see whether there was any correlation between the progress students who are, have, uh, are more inclined to a growth mindset have and whether uh, that's any different, any, whether there's any significant difference between their progress and students who have more of a fixed mindset. So what I did was I um, started with a kind of questionnaire that I adapted um, from other studies of mindset that allowed students to rank themselves on a scale of 1 to 60 uh, in terms of mindset. Closer to 60 meant much more inclined to a growth mindset, closer to 1 meant much more inclined to a fixed mindset. Um, I use that as a kind of baseline of data, um, and then against those readings for two classes, I tried to track how students did, and whether they made progress over the course of the year. Intuitively, if you are growth mindset, it suggests you would expect to see more effort, because effort equals attainment, as opposed to a fixed mindset where it's not necessarily correlated, um, and you would expect to see more progress and growth, potentially. What I was interested to find is that didn't really hold up at all. Um, there was no real correlation. I mean, interestingly, the vast majority of the boys who I surveyed were more uh, inclined towards growth mindset. I think that's perhaps a reflection of their age, that you know, they're in second form, they're in year eight, their ideas aren't perhaps as fixed as they would become later in GCSE. We, we generally tend to get students in year 10 beginning to despair, I'm not really good at maths. So I'd be interested in kind of more longitudinal study of do their, do their mindsets change, do their attitudes change, are their mindsets about uh, fixed mindset or growth mindset. Um, and I'd also be interested in sort of charting the development over the course of a few years. Is a year a big enough window of time to see whether these mindsets bear out and see whether these ideas uh, have any influence? And also, I'm interested in our data collection. Is our data collection of teacher <coughs> effort? Is that good enough as a measure? Can we really say, as an outside observer, you didn't do very well, therefore you're probably not trying. Oh, you did really well, therefore you must be putting a lot of effort. So it's caused me to kind of reflect on how do we assess how students make progress, how do we assess effort, and left me with a lot more questions than I began with, which is probably always a good thing. That's what I did. Uh, hi, um, I'm head of religion and philosophy at CLS, and I was um, as such very interested in the subject of creativity. We study um, the idea of free will versus determinism as part of our uh, course, and um, creativity is something that we say that we offer as a subject. So I really wanted to 
dig a bit deeper into that and see what that really um, involved. I started off with the, the idea, this was my initial thought, we need to define creativity. So I went through, I did a bit of reading, I did a bit of thinking, and um, I sort of came up with a variety of different definitions. And in the end, I was, I was in a bit of a cog line, because I thought, actually, I'm not sure if this is really very really helpful as regards any kind of study. So in the end, I decided to sort of bin it and ask the boys um, for a question there. What do you think? How do you define uh, creativity? Um, and how can creativity, in your view, be, um, be encouraged? Um, so the initial question I find is essentially came up with the idea that they thought that creativity, the place for creativity is mostly through homework. So in homework time they have the space for creativity. Um, and they also felt like more open-ended projects would be quite useful to develop their creativity. Um, and they also thought that debate and discussion helps to develop creativity based on the definition of creativity. Um, and so I set up a, a project. It was a, it was a project that we'd already done. We did, we did it the year before last. Um, on my philosophy on life. And in this time I set up uh, responding to their questionnaire findings. Um, and uh, so we yeah, I responded to what they said, we had a little philosophy circle time, sent them off with their project, and I gave them uh, a variety of things that they could do that they said might help them to be more creative. Um, after they handed them their projects, I marked them, I handed them back, and then I gave them another um, questionnaire to see if they thought help them to be more creative. They did think it would help them to be more creative, this group of boys, but there's only 24 boys, so we have to say it's not really very statistically um, significant. Um, in particular, they felt that the, giving them a, an option as, as to the way they presented their work, so they could have gone for a poster, they could have gone for an animation, they could have gone for all sorts of ways of presenting their work. But this is kind of where the unintended consequences came out in the final, uh, the final reckoning. Um, they really took umbrage at um, something I'd instituted at the beginning, which was the marking criteria, where I gave them 20% of the marks for um, information, because I wanted to steer them away from this idea of just churning out information, uh, and uh, far more marks for creativity and presentation. And they really had a problem with this. They were <coughs> discriminating against those who were better suited to uh, uh, turning over information. Um, so the, the feedback I got was that actually I should consult them not only about what should make them more creative, but I should also consult them about the market criteria that I used before I set them the project. And so the sort of unintended consequence of this whole thing for me was that actually that at the end of it, one boy said to me that actually the most creative thing we've done in the whole project was actually discuss the project and work through the project together and then reflect on the project later on. Now, I hadn't thought about this. This definitely didn't fit in with my uh, first uh, approach of some de definition of uh, creativity and then filtering something through that. It didn't fit with that at all. But the second consequence was it, it forced me to reflect a little bit more on, on how I teach them, how much, essentially, how much respect I give them. Because ultimately, if I'm going to say you should be creative and I want you to be creative, I kind of have to trust that their choices that they make in some way, are part of the creative process. So um, you'll see from the poster very, um, very tentative results, as it were, and certainly no statistical relevance at all. Uh, but it really helped me to think about how we can take things like Project Work forward and, and enable it to be creative. So, and I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this group. It's good fun. Thanks, Jim. Um, hello, everybody. <coughs> uh, my name's Joe, and uh, I'm on the leadership team at the City of London School. And it was my um, appointment to a new role um, about three years ago now that was the start point for these cycles of research. And in fact, I'd been to quite an early research ed conference. This was something that uh, Joe succeeded me. Joe was, uh, replaced me as the head of religion and philosophy. So I moved from that uh, into a leadership role where I have a variety of responsibilities, one of which is around teaching and learning and our kind of research in school. Um, so I made contact uh, with the Institute of Education and said, this is kind of what I'm thinking about, this is what I'm interested in. And I think I work in a school where people would like to do some of these kinds of bits of work. So um, just for a couple of minutes, the, the spiel in your programme said um, some information about our story of what we've been doing. So I thought you might find it useful if you are a school leader or you want to take this idea back to your school, just for me to kind of explain what we've done and how it's worked, sort of nuts and bolts things. Um, so we've been in partnership with the Institute for two years now, and we've run two cycles of research. 
Uh, so at the very first um, start, the very first cycle, um, I was actually quite nervous. Um, I stood up on the first day of term in September uh, and extended um, an open invite to any member of the teaching staff who wanted to come and join me to do some research. Um, I said we'd be working with the Institute of Education and you could look at anything you wanted to look at that interested you professionally. And I felt very strongly from the start that this was a real important thing for me. Having sounded out other people in similar kind of roles doing stuff about teaching learning, they said, well, I asked everybody in the school to look at it. And I said, well, how did that go? Yeah, not very well. And I kind of thought, well, that's no great surprise, is it? And actually, teachers can be great if you empower them to look at the things they want to look at and that they feel are relevant to their very particular context of their classroom, their subject, their school, and, and, and what you're up to. Um, so I was quite nervous to start with, uh, and nine members of staff joined me in the first year. Uh, and they conducted um, bits of research, almost exactly the same as this, um, that Mark uh, um, showed you the sign of. Um, it happened in school, as well as feeling that I wanted to empower staff to look at what interested them. I felt strongly that this should not be squeezed into additional time. I kind of think that's unfair. If you are a teacher who is keen to improve yourself, shouldn't we as schools be supporting that? Um, if you asked to go on an inset, the school would front up uh, two, three, four, five hundred quid's worth of day out for you by the time you paid for cover and to go to wherever the inset is. So I felt that we as a, a school should be supporting people to have time off timetable. Um, people from the, uh, we had, who, was, who came the first time? Uh, pro pro no, Professor Graham Huntscombe was the research we worked with. Sorry. He came in about twice a term for about half a day. And I moved those slots through the working week each time. So the people taking part never missed the same lessons. There was never a great burden on cover. And we kind of shunted it around through the week. Um, and I think those kinds of things, on a nuts and bolts level, were quite important. We as a school were supportive. We invested time and money in what people were doing. We, um, I think in asking the, the Institute to, to come and work with us, I think engaging external expertise um, gave real kind of um, validity and um, a degree of prestige to what we were doing, I think. That, that this somehow took it beyond just a group of teachers wanting to talk and reflect on what they were doing, and that we had an institution enabling us to be more rigorous in what we were doing. Um, the result of our first year of work um, was a number of posters like these. So at the start of last academic year, I ran an um, after-school poster conference. So we had the posters printed up, uh, as you can see, around the room. I put them on boards. We had a nice big room, and I invited the teaching staff to come and have a look after school and chat to the people who had done the research. Um, it was fine, but on reflection, I don't think that many people came. So part of the value of research is to make it public, to share what you're doing with your colleagues or with the wider community. Um, I don't think we made enough of it. So at the start of this year, um, I carved out time in the whole staff inset, and all of these posters uh, were displayed for the coffee break that followed us doing a pitch about what we've been up to and inviting staff to join this year. So this year will be year three. Um, Richard and Joe are going to, if you like, further professionally develop themselves by being our research leads this year and working with colleagues. So I'm looking that we continue to develop people and to build capacity within the school. Um, and at the, the current team sheet, there are five heads of department who said, actually, I thought that was really interesting, your presentation on Monday. Please can I come and take part? Uh, we have uh, English, religion and philosophy, learning support, maths, geography, heads of department, plus four other colleagues. And I think that's fantastic in a school to say these people would like to take part um, and involve themselves in, in this stuff that I feel should be really relevant to your own particular context. I'm quite enthusiastic about it. And I feel it's been a real success for the people who've taken part. And I feel if I, in any way, can share that with you or your schools or talk to you about what we've done, 
then that is a good thing. Um, I'm conscious that there's about five minutes left, and if you have questions for anybody, then do please ask them. Do you have anything you want to add to anything? Hello. Hi, um, I'm very new to teaching, so um, I'm sort of washing around the department, but my um, background is in medicine. Um, so I started um, thinking about research and looking at research back in the 80s. I think in 1985 was about my time when we started um, going to the library, looking at research uh, for our thesis. You'd have to wait two weeks for it to come back because it wasn't in the IT. Um, right up until um, about so it's only five years really since I started to new career, right up until about five years ago when we do scientific poster conferences online and things like that. Um, <coughs> and I think the biggest thing that I've um, seen with the difference in medicine and research and the difference in, in, and I don't know whether, I'm hoping not to offend anybody at all, but do you think there's a reluctance for teaching staff to take part in research just in case it doesn't quite work out as planned, because I feel everybody's very possessive about their subjects, they want things to work, it's got to be positive. And whereas in research in medicine, we were used to having um, not only access to massive amount of research, but if you were doing research in care, my specialism was ITU, um, if it didn't work, it didn't work, nobody, you know, it wasn't an accountability of your professionalism. And I just wondered whether... I feel like these three guys already Sorry. answered that. Yeah. They all said, you didn't quite turn out where yeah. I did. Yeah. I, 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 actually, Richard's probably did, but uh, Nick and Joe saying, well, I didn't really find anything that significant, but the process was interesting. Yeah. Or yeah. I found unintended consequences yeah. which have enriched my work as a and professional. So I would love to bring aspects of research into my role, though my role is just starting from a very basic level. But as I say, um, I'm really inspired by this because I think you have to be, you know, share research and share it even if it doesn't work. Do you know what? Uh, unashamed plug, do you wish to plug your website, which I think is a good example oh, of how yes. members of uh, colleagues in schools can do small bits of research supported by you on that their internet? Yes, indeed. So the, the Praxis Teacher Research, a very small little website that I set up so that teachers can share inquiries like these are very much hope that we can get these ones up. And the, the, you guys also do quite long written reports as well, as well as the posters. Yeah, it's it worth a mention. <coughs> so some, some people do. But can I just quickly add to that point? Because I think that some schools get it wrong in the sense that they make it an accountability measure. They say everybody's got to do a research project. And it, they might even go so far as to say you've got to do it on X. And that, that you can get out of that by, sort of, by, by quite delicately saying it is an expectation that you're going to engage in this process. What the outcomes are, is, 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 that's not accountable. It's like we want you to find stuff that doesn't work, if, if anything. Yeah. That's more useful, right? Because then we can figure out what, what we can exactly. do that's, that's I mean, better. My experience in research is it's all the more the better if you find something that doesn't work. Mm. <coughs> yes. My school were actually looking at the process we're starting this year. Um, we're going to have a look at asking people what is their plan over the next three years. And even though the research element is going to be part of, we've now moved away from um, performance management, it's actually performance development. So that SLT has really kind of <coughs> taken part into, like, we're not, you're not going to be, it's not going to be, yes, you're going to fail, no, you did, or you're going to pass, and depending on the, the research that you're going to get. It really is about our own personal development, and as a result of them, improve, trying to improve teaching and as a result improving the learning mm -hmm. and and that's been so refreshing having been to other schools and right now you're going to do that but you're going to have to be accountable for it and I think because at the end of the day we still want the best for our kids so even if it's something that's not going to work perfectly you're still going to try to get the best outcomes if it doesn't work perfectly I know another thing not to use exactly Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, it might be controversial, but um, where we are now, it, it is directed for everyone, and it's, it's target one of you, um, professional development, but it's not your evidence <coughs> that's judged, it's not whether something works or not, it's your engagement in the process, and um, school have actually committed quite heavily to that, but in our meeting cycle, the hubs, which is... I think what you guys have done has been one of our meetings. So 
I think there's, uh, there's clearly a lot of different ways to do it, and we've gone down the lesson study route um, to sort of back it up. Um, but I think it, if we started to judge whether things have worked or not as the criteria, then we've gone down the, right, the wrong path completely. It's the engagement. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what I was sort of trying to say, really, is the fact that I hope teachers don't feel underconfident in approaching research and don't feel as though they've got, it's got to work. I think that's the ethos of the school, yeah. there, isn't it? But it's a very well made point, though, isn't it? Like, and I, I wonder that's, that's, that. that's why there was a that's why there's a, a little bit of reluctance in engaging sometimes. The reluctance, I, I think, would be, you know, I'm an A level teacher, so. If I try something around year 13, and it not that it doesn't work, but it actually has a negative impact, it's their results and their yeah. university yeah. That's the kind of, yeah. it's not, it's not, it would be ridiculous to suggest that you have to get a significantly positive result or whatever, otherwise it's failed, because that's not scientific research. Um, um, my yeah. concern, um, obviously, sorry, but of course it's also, my concern is if you're not a head of department, like for example, like I'm sure a lot of us are, so we're an NQT and they're like, you've got a billion things to do as an NQT. First of all, we can't even get on board in things like this. Um, or if, even if we want to talk about it, they're like, you're an NQT and you've got a billion other things to do, so your focus for this year is this. But actually, I've always been interested in this ever since I was doing my BA and then my master's and everything. And it's just the right time for me personally if I, if I say that. But then, would you say that I would wait until I've finished this NQT year? Or, do you know what I mean? It's, for example, I, in the whole of the department, I could be interested in all this. You know what? I go to my head of department, let's do this, like, let's research to be able to understand our kids in our academy. But how do I get them on board to actually support me and say that, you know what, this is a great idea? I know it's going to take time, and I know the reason is because it's all about grades and getting them and curriculum. I'd say the first thing is you don't need permission to try it. Um, I mean, you know, you, you, you plan your lessons, you teach your lessons, and you assess the work that comes out of the lessons. But that's not a million miles away from a, an inquiry title. Yeah. Um, you, you, could, you could design that, you could adjust that in whichever way you need to do. Because you, you, your first your first job is to teach these kids and get them to you know, make as much progress as they can and whatever. But you can you can design a, a, a very simple inquiry cycle around that, which is uh, which looks just like teaching, but it's, but you're making a little bit more conscious effort to gather data which you wouldn't otherwise have gathered, and, and then present that back to the head of department you feel might be a little bit reluctant to let you do this and say look it does work. I mean the process does work. Um, not that necessarily the results are better, but the process does work. I have learned something which is worthwhile, maybe you want to try something as well. Can I just sneak in there though? Because that's good professional yeah. learning and development. Mm -hmm. And any kind of inquiry project mm -hmm. is about professional learning and development. It isn't only about the outcome. At my place, I mean, NQT is full of a specific program apart from, you know, that's different from professional development but they are highly encouraged to actually take any elements of research and share that with their, with their team to be able to, to go further with that. Well, I mean, I think based on what Richard said about his own project in terms of how to achieve mastery or something, well, it's about sustained reflection and thinking about something and how you improve it. I think we can apply it to that. The way of developing yourself as an NQT, essentially what you want to be when you're a reflective practitioner. Someone who thinks about what have I tried, how has it worked, how can I do it differently. I, I'm saying that is a person of how I improve. I think it's just, it's, I'm not going to mention names, but it's just this particular school that I come from. They're, it's just very <laughs> focused about, we're going to get this done. You don't have to think about that. Like, it's just the first week and it's giving me hell. Um, we, we Sorry. Are, we'll be given hell if we get yeah. out lunch. Um, but um, we'll, be, we'll be clearing up. So if anybody wants to sort of hang around for a few minutes to continue the discussion, that'd be great. But Thanks for coming. We thought we were going to turn up. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so much. 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 Oh, yeah, so much.